Hey guys, Solomon here. Hope you're having a great day. If you've been following the series so far this week, you will know that I uh, recently played in a tournament down in SoCal. And in the first two games, I, you know, I'm a hippo guy, right? Played the hippopotamus defense both games. Game one, I ended up winning against an international master. We did 25-13, my best win to date. Game two, I ended up losing to a 22-79. Carl the Crusher uh, got equality, right? In fact, a little bit of a better position with the hippo. Uh, but ended up throwing it away in the end game. Now I'm thrown right into game three, right? I'm in the two day schedule. So these games are back to back to back. And I'm going up against a player uh, by the name of Esther, a strong teenage uh, player down in the uh, California area. And okay, I'm playing as white and I'm going into this thing like, okay, you know, I beat a 25 13. I just lost to a master. I got to win this one, right? Really wanted to win this one. Wanted to play aggressive with the hippo. And I start this thing off with the move of b3. Now, surprisingly, Esther plays e5. This is actually pretty rare. I don't see this a ton when I play the move of b3, probably because players are a little bit, you know, just cautious about bishop b2. e5 is very committal in terms of the setup that black is trying to get. Uh, of course, here she plays knight c6. And okay, I mean, by the way, guys, if you know, if you play the hippo or if you play Larson's opening, whatever, if you're a big fan of the Owens defense, you could play this move of e3 here, looking to attack the knight on c6. And there's a good chance you're going to get pretty much a reverse Owens defense, but up a tempo, right? So that is one option available to you. Here as white, though, I go for the double fianchetto, right? I'm going for that hippo. And, uh, okay, you know the drill. I ended up putting my pawns on d3 and e3 pretty quickly. That way, if, if black plays here, I can lock it up, right? Black pushes on the e-file. I'm locking that, that thing right up, right? So... Here, I'm, I'm already feeling good about my setup. Uh, I play h3, tuck my knight. By the way, guys, I had to play h3 before I play knight e2 because I don't want to deal with bishop h3, right? Now now that the pawn is on h3, bishop takes h3 is just silly, right? Because I can simply just capture back with the bishop and the bishop will be defended by my rook. So you got two attackers, I got two defenders. You simply can't capture, right? We have bishop e7, I tuck my knight. We have a6, I play a3, now reaching that, you know, thick-skinned, full hippo, move 10. And now Esther plays castling queen set, right? Really playing an aggressive and dynamic setup. I decide to, you know, start attacking with the move of b4. I tuck that knight right behind. Uh, this is probably my favorite middle game, uh, you know, counter-attacking idea, attacking idea. Uh, just a nice way to gain space, not give up a whole ton in the process. We have queen e6. I did think that this move was a little bit strange, um, but yeah, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's a huge mistake or anything, right? Uh, the computer has us at dead even here. I play queen d2 just so that my king has has options, right? And, and really, at the same time, on top of having options, it's going to be hard for black to guess where I'm going, right? Am I staying in the center? Am I castling king side? Am I castling queen side? My king can be I mean, you know, c1 or g1 at a moment's notice. It's going to be hard for the opponent to guess which way my king is going. And if you attack one way, I can just castle the other, right? And at the moment, my king's safe. My king's very safe in the center, so I'm not in a huge rush to castle at the moment. Here, Esther just continues by bringing her second rook to the center, right? This is a pretty standard setup, right? I mean, the queen on e6 looks a little bit uh, abnormal, but besides that, I mean, this all looks, looks pretty, uh, you know, down the line, down the normal uh, ideas. So, okay, I play knight c3. And against d4, I play knight a4, right? On top of tucking a knight, you can bring the second knight over. And in this case, these knights are working together to attack the square of c5. And notice, once one of my knights jumps in there, it's going to be protected by another knight. And it's going to be attacking a ton of key squares. Here, Esther takes on e3, right? I capture back with my f-pawn. Notice here that g3 is a little bit weaker, but I'm not seeing an easy way for black to take advantage of it at the moment, right? I mean, if you play something like knight h5, uh, I could just play g4, right? And we simply have a fork, right? We have a fork now, and we're chilling. So, you know, going back after d takes, I'm totally cool with taking with the f pawn. In this instance, g3, sure, it doesn't have a pawn defending it, but it's going to be hard for black to make any any kind of target, right? We see this move b6, a solid move here from Esther. Uh, you know, at the time, I thought it was a little bit uh, risky, but it turns out that it's totally fine for black, just, you know, preventing one of these knights from jumping in. I now decide to castle queenside, and Esther here takes quite a bit of time in the game. I actually got up, started walking around. Um, up to this point, I haven't had to think a whole ton, uh, just because, you know, the hippo, the first 10 moves are somewhat easy, and from that point, you know, the more that you play the hippo, the more you study it, the more you study the master, grandmaster games, you kind of have a general framework of where you want to go. Um, 
But here she plays the move of bishop e4. This this surprised me. I did not see that. I did not see bishop e4. Um, it's a good move, though, because if you look at this position, which bishop is better? I think, without a shadow of a doubt, it's the bishop on g2. Right? This bishop is a monster. Uh, cutting you know right on the knight on c6 and, and these light squares as well. Great attacking piece. This bishop, on the other hand, I mean, it's not terrible. It's not, it's not like the worst bishop I've ever seen. It's not like a French bishop, right? Uh, but... I mean, you know, it's 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 simply not as active and, and it's it's not as dangerous at the end of the day, right? So here she offers a trade. I you know I decide to take and just fianchetto my queen, right? Quote unquote, right? I just replace the bishop with the queen, go down that diagonal. Uh, here we see the knight retreat, and I centralize my rooks as well. King b8. Um, this is just a you know, this is this is the kind of move that you're gonna see, um, you know, top top level players making king, king b8. Whole idea being that. Now, from now on, if this knight moves, I don't have all these, whoa, queen a8 check ideas, right? King b8 is played, and now for the rest of this game, I don't have queen b7, queen a8 ideas, right? At least without support of a knight or something like that. So, you know, very solid move, just tucking that king away a little bit. I play d4, expanding in the center, and we now see uh, Esther continue with e4, advancing herself. I play queen f1. Notice here, I'm really trying to uh, play dynamically with my queen. I'm defending this pawn. I'm on the f-file, and, and at the moment, I'm threatening to capture this pawn on a6, right? So here in this case, uh, you know, black decides to, to defend it, and we have c4. So notice here, I'm just taking up as much space as I possibly can. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you know, a solid edge, if you plug it into the computer here for white, uh, up to this point, we've kind of just played solid hippo chess, you know, uh, got that knight behind the b-pawn, got this knight over to a4, started expanding a little bit. All right. But here I had a big decision to make, and that's that's how the heck do I make progress from this point? I could have went with this move of c5, uh, which which looks which looks potentially dangerous because I mean, who knows what's next? Is b5 next followed by, you know, throwing in the queen, right? I mean, really trying to get that king. The problem is that queen e6 happens, and and now my knight is just threatened, right? My knight my knight's about to drop and this queen's kind of slicing and dicing on the light squares. If I play something like king c2, Black's pieces start to fill in the gaps, right? I gave up d5. I gave up, the, gave up that diagonal. Black is filling that pretty quickly. And notice something like queen c4. It, it doesn't work for a number of reasons, okay? But the number one being that black can just play knight, takes e3 with a fork, right, on the king and the queen. And if you take, you're still losing your queen, right? So that's, that's not ideal. Notice here, before I play c5, right, which I didn't play, by the way, uh, I mean, the, these pawns are wiping out a ton of squares. Five squares on the fifth rank. These knights at the moment don't really have anywhere to go. I play this move of d5, right? Whole idea being that instead of playing c5 right away and giving up the square of e6, I play d5, and then I play the move of c5, right? Notice now, there's no queen e6, there's no knight d5, this queen is under fire, and there's a lot of different ways that Esther could have messed this up, but she played a great defensive game. I gotta hand it to her. What are, the, what are the possible moves that Black could think about here? Notice, knight t3 check, something like that, doesn't work. Doesn't do anything. Okay, well, I, I guess it does do something. It loses a piece because we're just going to take with the rook. And, you know, if if the queen runs away, you just kind of lost a piece for no reason. And if you take the rook, you just lost your queen. All right, so so knight takes, I, just, I mean, you know, knight check, I just take it. Right, and I'm still threatening your queen. So that doesn't do anything. Right, uh, going back, right, c5. What else could we see? Well, a move like b takes c5, this is this is generally not good to trade pawns in front of your king. Of course, you could argue, well, white as well, you know, has pawns in front of the king. We have a ton of space, though, and, and this king is just super vulnerable to attack. We can play a move like knight a5 with check, right? And, uh, okay, if king c8 or king a8, we're actually going to take off this knight. Right, and if the queen captures back, we're going to take with a check against the opponent, uh, against the enemy king. What about king a7? Well, in this case, uh, we're still going to take on e5. We're taking on e5, and now we're playing knight c6, powerhouse fork. Uh, and the very next move, uh, okay, thanks for the queen. Right, so no matter what, we're going to have a queen thrown in, a knight thrown in. Black is in a ton of trouble there. So really, with the move c5, black only has one move that is going to give them any kind of fighting chance in this game, and that is queen d7. I now continue with the move of c6, right, forking the king and the queen. Uh, of course, you know, at this point, uh, the knight can capture back, which is what happens. By the way, I was looking at this move of bishop takes e5, but I was very concerned about queen takes a4. 
right? Simply capturing off my minor piece. So I, I play the move of c6 to check, right? Play c6, you take, I now take on f6. Esther here finds the best move knight takes b4. There's a ton of different things that black could have tried to do there, but knight takes b4 was the best. Why is that? Well, notice here in this exact position, right? I'm not, you know, stuff could happen here, but in this position, if we count out the material, white is up one point, one point, right? So, I mean, it's great. I'm happy with that. But at the same time, it's, you know, there's still a lot that can happen here. By taking here, uh, notice black is also reopening their eye to that knight on a four, which is kind of just hanging there, right? So uh, I had some options here. I ended up going with bishop takes e7. Uh, and, you know, really bishop takes e7, a takes b4. The computer has these at right around dead even. Apparently, the best move here was knight a c5 with check. I don't even want to try to explain this move to you. Okay, this is th this line's one of those like stockfish comes up with a line and you kind of just sit there and go, cool. I don't know what I'm going to learn from that, but thanks. Thanks, stockfish. Right? Uh, I mean, yeah, here, here's the line. I'm just going to show you the line. Okay? So here, apparently, I messed up by not playing knight a c5. Uh, if we play check, the bishop captures back. This is the computer line. Okay? We take back. Then we take the knight, queen a4, we play rook d2. Okay, we don't even take this rook. We just play rook d2. Um, I, I mean, I guess in, in a sense, it's like, well, uh, if we take this bishop, we're, we're going to lose the knight, which is what happened in the game. So why don't we give up this knight, right, and kind of rearrange our target, uh, that being the knight on b4, okay? Um, all that being said, I missed this. Okay. And by the way, if you think that this is an easy move to find, let me know down in the comment section below, just so I know, uh, that I am not very good at chess. Okay. So just, you know, seriously, if you saw this move props to you, I, to me, that's not easy, but let me know what you think about that. Okay. I ended up just taking off this Bishop. Um, and, and here again, she plays the computer move. Queen takes a four, right? Picks off that knight. Now I really had some issues, okay? I took quite a bit of time on this move, um, and I ended up playing the computer line, which is king b2, looks freaking crazy, but here's the issue. If I take the knight, which is what I wanted to do, the queen captures uh, you know, my knight on b3, and sure, I'm up a piece for two pawns, but a5 is on the way. And when a5 is played, and it is gonna be played, right? It is on its way, unless we just give him a queen or something. Uh, where's this bishop going to go? Can't go there. Or there. Or there. Or there. Or there. It can only go there. And when the bishop goes all the way back, the queen can take on a3 with check. That's the big thing. Black's threatening a5. The bishop is going to be forced to get off this diagonal. And then black just wins a pawn. Right? Now, if my queen was on g2 or something, I, I love this position. Queen c2, trade off queens, up a piece for two pawns. We're in business. But I can't do that, right? Black is going to get that pawn back. And, um, yeah, there's just, it's just kind of, if you look at white's pieces, you know, an awkward move here just isn't going to solve everything. It's just not, right? So, um, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, just concerned, uh, you know, in a position like this, what the heck to do. Notice, by the way, as well, I wanted to mention that, you know, rook d2, a5, I could play here. Right, and, and kind of try to kick this queen off of that square. Even then, black could play queen a4, keep the pressure, or they could just take off that pawn. Right, now we're sitting at, you know, I mean, we're up a piece, but we're also down three pawns. So, very, very hard position to handle here. I, I would say that white's king is much more exposed than black's. So, going back um, to queen takes a4, that's one thing. I also saw this move of a takes. Okay, I saw this move, but then I realized that my knight would hang. And I mean, what am I going to do here? My bishop's being attacked. I mean, the best thing that I can, I can't hold on to this pawn, right? The best thing that I can do is just take a rook, but then black would have threefold repetition, right? They could just, you know, Esther could just check and check and check and check and we'd have a draw. Turns out that I probably should have took the draw, right? Looking at the end result of the game, but I saw, I, I thought I had a better position here and I did. So I went for the win, right? Sometimes in chess, that's what you risk. You see a draw, you see that, you know, the opponent can get a draw. You push for a win. Sometimes you lose. Sometimes you win. Sometimes you draw. Right. Uh, that's just that's just how tournament chess goes. Um, so, OK, I mean, going back, queen takes a four. I end up playing king b2. Right. All I do being I don't want this queen here. I don't want the queen coming in with check. I'm just holding the fort here. I'm holding the fort. Right. You play knight d3 with check. I'm just going to take it. Right. Capture back your rook. I'm chilling. So 
Here we see the move of rook takes on e7. I take on b4. The queen captures back. I play rook d4, attacking the queen. I play rook a1, threatening a6. And now after rook a8, uh, the computer move is actually rook c1. Now, the computer move is also rook a1. Some of you guys might be wondering, uh, okay, against queen d6, why wouldn't we just play rook c1 instead of two moves? Well, in general, guys, we don't want to move the same piece twice, right? Especially in the opening. Uh, but in the middle game, it's different, right? And in this specific uh, instance, of course, we usually, you know, if I can go to B3 right away, I don't want to go to A2, B2, you know, A3, this, that, this, that, and then that square. But in this case, if I go to Rook C1 right away, there's a Rook on D8. If I play Rook A1, attacking that pawn on A6, Black can't play a move like B5. That's super weakening to A5. The Knight's going to go in there cause a ton of havoc, right? So uh, a5 is also weakening to black's situation, right? The queen has a square to jump into. A lot of stuff can happen there. So black has to play rook a8. I then bring the rook over to c1. Notice what we did here. Simply by playing that, we got this rook to move. Then we play here. And this is an improvement for white. It is an improvement to have a rook on a8 that isn't really doing much compared to a rook on d8 that is attacking our pawn on d5, which is a pretty big target, right? So this is what I should have went with. Uh, however, after rook a, I play queen c4. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Esther here continuing to play great defense. Uh, queen takes g3 uh, is not what was played. That would have been a big mistake because I have queen c6 with check. King a7. Why is this so bad? Rook takes a6. Given up the rook. Rook flies over. We have a ball game. That's it, right? Queen c6 check. As you just saw, king a7 doesn't work. Our, our rook just kind of blows through the a file and we're winning. What about king b8? In this case, we have d6 trying to just break this position open. You could throw in a check. That's fine. I can, you know, just run away with my king. Uh, and if you take, um, throw in a check. I mean, there's just there's just no way that, that black's going to, you know, survive this game very long if white plays it correctly. Right. All that being said, though, after queen c4, we have the move of f5. Right. And, and part of me, I mean, uh, uh, not just part of me, I, I, I do wish I just played a move like Rook C1 and continued to add the pressure. At this point, Esther was very low on time. As I mentioned before, by playing the hippo, I almost always have uh, a time advantage in this tournament. Uh, I believe I had a time advantage uh, five out of the six games, um, maybe four, but at least I, I think it was five. Um, so, you know, I had a time advantage here. Um, I ended up playing with the move, playing the move of queen b4 though, right? She was under time pressure. I'm playing queen b4. I'm looking at knight a5 stuff, attacking the king. She captures and I take back. The reason I like this line is because I was trying to complicate things. Of course, why would I trade down queens if I was trying to complicate things? I don't know. Should have just kept queens on the board, but here's the idea. There's a lot of ways that black can mess up here, okay? Uh, let's just say a move like rook d8 is played, attacking this pawn, right? Now I play knight a5 with check. No matter where your king goes, knight c6, these rooks are simply forked. Right, going back. Let's say you play a move like rook d7, trying to attack this pawn d5. Nice d5 check comes in. Guess what? You're losing your rook again. I got two rooks. You got one. White's simply winning this. Okay, but Esther continues to play great defensive chess. King a7. I played knight d4. Uh, you know, threatening a fork here. We have rook d7, rook c1. Right. Whole idea being that if you want to take here, uh, c7 is going to be under fire. The king walks over. And I now play this move of rook b c4. Not the best move. I think this is kind of where things started to go south a little bit. I should have just played knight e6. Okay, knight e6 continuing to pile up on this pawn, right? But also kind of giving myself the, you know, the possibility of, of defending this pawn if I need to. And if I move like king b8, by the way, knight e6 on top of just piling up, it also does threaten knight c5 with check again, winning the exchange. If the king runs away, I can start building up in this fashion, right? Now black has to play a very awkward move like rook i7. I play knight d4, trying to reroute that knight to c6. If you play a move like king up, I take this pawn. These pawns are gonna start falling off like candy and white's in business, white with a big edge, right? But after king b7, I just play here right away and black can actually just play rook f8, right? Whole idea being that if I move like knight e6, uh, you know, I mean, rook f7 um, is in the cards, right? And when I play the move of rook c6, we still have rook f to f7. Uh, I ended up taking on h6, but losing the pawn on d5. Unfortunately, I do not have the rest of this game uh, annotated because uh, we were both starting to go into time trouble and time pressure. 
Um, the rest of the games, by the way, uh, in the series, I have every single move covered. So you'll see to the end. Sometimes with those quicker time controls, you just, you know, I just can't, I just can't write every move down. I ended up losing this game though. And, um, yeah, I definitely gave up the edge, right? There were some moments where I definitely could have capitalized, definitely could have used my time advantage better, not just, you know, I don't want to play hopeful chess. I want to really calculate and try to find the best move every single time. I should have definitely done that uh, in a couple of those instances down the stretch. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I ended up losing this this end game. I mean, the, the computer has it at, you know, 0 0.6 for white. So I, I still have the edge, but I will say it's it was very difficult to play this. Um, and I ended up just dropping the ball. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, I'm up a piece, but I'm also down three pawns, and they're all connected and they're all passed. So she kind of just started flinging these pawns down. I think I could have been a lot more aggressive with my own pawns instead of just trying to defend everything. Um, and uh, even here, you can make an argument that h4 is not the best move, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of moves here that the computer recommends, um, like rook h5, rook f1, just, just moves putting pressure on these pawns. Um, but I ended up, uh, yeah, just just losing this game and uh yeah it was a it was a heartbreaker i mean after this one i was i was pretty 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 upset i mean it's kind of weird you start out the day by beating a 25 13 with the hippo right then you lose a game you could have drew then you lose another game that you could have drew right but in this one it was less that i was less upset with myself for not taking the draw the perpetual you saw i was more upset that i just had a winning position and i you know i fumbled it over kind of you know certain moves all that being said though esther played a great defensive game so many of her moves were the very best and um yeah i definitely learned a lot from this one hope you enjoyed it and i hope to see you tomorrow hey thanks for watching today's video i hope you enjoyed it wanted to give a big shout out to my patreon supporters for the month of june in 2023 if you haven't checked out the patreon before uh, go make sure to check it out we'd love to have you join the family and we are continuing to add more and more benefits um, that you get right by becoming a member as always thanks for watching this video and i hope to see you in the next one